Well over 100 companies, some say more, are working on new EVATOL aircraft, meaning electrically powered vertical takeoff and landing models that promise more efficient and cleaner ways to move people and things around. Many of the designs mark a radical departure from traditional aircraft, so much so that regulators are still refining the rules under which they'll be certified. The front runners in what has all the buzz of the space race include ambitious, cash hungry startups such as Archer, Joby, Volocopter, Lilium, and Vertical Aerospace. But there are many other companies at various stages of progress with their projects. So how do companies go about developing completely new aircraft, getting them from an initial concept, through type certification, and into production? We knocked on the door at Archer, which is working on a five-seat EVATOL that it aims to start operating for air taxi services in cities such as Los Angeles and Miami by 2024. And in fact, United Airlines has already signed up to purchase some of these aircraft. And we had the chance to speak with Chief Engineer Jeff Bauer, since earning a PhD in aircraft design at Stanford, he's since worked at companies including Z Aero, which later became part of Kitty Hawk, and Airbus, before joining Archer in January 2020. We asked him how he and his colleagues intend to achieve this task, starting with the key first steps. So if you're doing it right, you start with a requirements set of requirements for your aircraft. Um, and these are, should be informed by a business or, or marketing uh, business or marketing requirements. So top level ones are our payload range and speed. Uh, there's also you know others that you might include around um, you know systems that you have on board. Are you providing environmental control for the passengers? How easy is it to get in and out? Uh, where where can you access right? Like what uh, what's your maximum density altitude you can fly at? Uh, anyways. Requirements like that. One of the unique things about these EV tolls, though, is that they're still kind of just on the cusp of possible. So you really do need to take into account, and there needs to be a feedback loop between the marketing team and the uh, the engineering team to really come to a, a set of requirements that you believe you can achieve and that are still useful uh, to an end customer. At the start of the design work, options are kept open. So you start in the, the conceptual design phase where you're performing lots of trade studies. So looking at different configurations, uh, looking at different sizes of the vehicle, trading off between those, those high level requirements like payload range and speed, uh, and seeing how the vehicle sizes out to achieve, uh, you know, achieve a given set of requirements, and then how that translates back into a operating cost that would then uh, give you some indication of how profitable um, that that aircraft could be in the market or you know what people are willing to pay to use it so if you have a great design but it's super expensive and nobody's going to be able to fly it that's not very useful either engineers have to consider all aspects of how the aircraft will operate and what they will need to do that safely and efficiently most of the requirements are are around the facilities that you would operate in so for instance, uh, helipads are sized by what's called a D value. So if you can think of it as like the, the smallest circle that encloses a helicopter. So if you want to use existing helicopter infrastructure, you need to keep the footprint of the vehicle relatively small. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned density altitude before. So if you want to operate in Colorado in the summertime, the, the vehicle is going to be a little bit different than uh, one that doesn't. Or if you want to operate in Phoenix in the summer, you know, the operating temperature range is also also important. Quite often, aircraft developers use technology demonstrators and subscale models to make sure they're clear on how they want the full-scale prototype aircraft to look and perform. We're currently building a full-scale demonstrator uh, called Maker that will be flown by, by the end of this year. And in parallel with that, we've been flying over the last year uh, subscale models that are about a quarter scale of that. Uh, and those are really tools to develop our flight control laws, learn about the dynamics of the vehicle, a little bit about the aerodynamics. Um, and then in parallel, we're still, you know, we're, we're in the design phases of our, our production vehicle. We're learning lessons pretty much every day, both as we go through the design process and start testing the, the systems, the propulsion system, the avionics, et cetera. Uh, so there may be some, some learnings from there that, that carry over to the production vehicle. Manufacturers need to know what regulators expect of them to be able to demonstrate that their aircraft comply 
with all safety requirements. We have a very, very good understanding of what the requirements are. We've been working with the FAA uh, together for over a year. We're, we're very close to our, uh, having our negotiated certification basis uh, and working on establishing means of compliance to that certification basis. The next step is to build a prototype aircraft and fly it to prove that it performs as intended to accepted standards. Once we have a design uh, and get up through the, the CDR phase, so that's where you've done your critical design reviews for all your systems, then parts get released for manufacturing. Those will be built over the, you know, the next year or so. The vehicle will then get integrated. And even before a flight test, there's extensive ground testing that occurs. So this is all of the, all of the systems that go into the airplane get tested in uh, you know, their own test rigs, hardware in the loop simulation for software. Uh, yeah, structural testing, you know, you, you put, put a wing in a jig and, and bend it until it breaks. Those sorts of tests will, will be done. And then once it's fully integrated, uh, it'll go to a flight test site. And there we start the, the flight test process. Flight testing is really there to verify some of the requirements. So all of the requirements uh, that have a method of compliance associated with them, that could be design or analysis, but in many cases it will be flight test. So that's to really go out and prove that you meet the requirement that's been either internally, uh, internally set or externally set by the uh, certification authorities. So, you know, it's, it's part of the, the compliance process that you have to go and, and check all these boxes that show, yes, the aircraft is safe. Yes, it can handle all of these failure conditions appropriately. Even before you get into those compliance checks, uh, the other really important part of the flight test process is envelope expansion. So your first flight, you're not going to go out there and, and do a vertical takeoff and fly your maximum range and then, you know, in, in your maximum Gs and all that and come back and land. You really build up through that flight envelope in a slow and methodical fashion. So you might start with a 30 second hover flight and then expand, expand the hover envelope, uh, start doing translations in hover to build up the, you know, the wind envelope. And then you start your transition building up airspeed and then you go through altitude, speed, turns, uh, et cetera, to really, really prove out the airplane throughout its whole operating envelope. We are not planning to certify our airplane for flight into known icing. So we don't will not need to prove that we can de-ice the airplane in flight, for instance. We just need to be able to detect icing and exit those conditions. Um, that said, you know, if you, uh, most commercial aircraft are designed to operate from something like negative 50 degrees Celsius up to 50 degrees Celsius, right? Flying at high altitude or in the Arctic all the way to Phoenix in the middle of the summer or Dubai. Um, so it's unclear if from a marketing standpoint, we need to operate in all of those conditions or whether the the temperature uh, range that we're designing for is a little bit smaller, at least with this first generation of aircraft. Through the flight test process, you first do company flight testing, where you kind of prove to yourself that you're going to be able to achieve all those uh, requirements. And then the last step is where you go and do a subset of those flights with FAA pilots or observers on board. The engineers need to focus hard on the main technology risks that could delay or compromise the success of a new aircraft. From a, a technical standpoint, there are three major challenges where these aircraft are very different than, than existing airplanes. So the first is obviously the electric propulsion system, which I like to separate into the energy storage. So in our case, uh, the battery system, the electric propulsion units, so the electric motors. And then the third is the fly-by-wire flight control system. So this is uh, you know something that's common in commercial aviation, but it's not Fly-by-wire is not common in small aircraft, so there's some new, uh, new and novel aspects there, as well as the over-actuated nature of these vehicles. So they have lots of actuators, so there's not a, always a very simple direct mapping, say, from uh, the pilot's pitch stick to the elevator, right? In, in hover for these vehicles, that pitch stick changes the commands to all of the motors, uh, for instance. So there's some... You know, we, we have a very good understanding of all of these systems and what it's going to take, but they're, they haven't been through the certification process before. So that's, uh, those are the, the areas where I think the most effort needs to go. As certification approaches, companies have to get ready to start mass production while ensuring that the same safety standards are delivered with each and every aircraft that rolls off the production line.
if you get a type certificate, that's great, but that doesn't mean you can produce uh, conforming articles to your type design. So the next step is obtaining a production certificate, um, which is a, basically you have to demonstrate the ability that all of the air, airframes that come off of your, your production line match the type design that you, you type certified. Uh, so this, this grows the org for sure. So you need, you know, the facility to do the manufacturing. You also need to worry about quality. So making sure that all the parts again, conform to their, their design within the, the appropriate tolerances, obviously manufacturing production flight test. There's a whole sort, a whole other side of the business beyond engineering that has to be able to take that engineering design and turn it into a producible vehicle at the, the rates that are desired. So what does Archer believe sets it apart from rivals in terms of the approach it's taking to launch this new advanced air mobility sector? I think one of the kind of unique things that Archer is doing relative to, to some of our competitors is we're trying to be like really pragmatic and, and do what's necessary for the business case. So we're not there to, to optimize every last drop of performance out of the vehicle if that adds cost or risk to the certification timeline. We're trying to use... Uh, you know, components and technologies that are available today, right? We're not not relying on future batteries. We're we're trying to use batteries that are available today because the reality is that it's it's going to take two or three years to certify a battery pack, and by the time you you want to enter service, you kind of have to you know choose the technology that's a a couple years old. Um, it doesn't mean we're not still keeping track and and working with uh, testing cells that are, are going to be viable in the future. But at least for now, we're, we're trying to be very pragmatic and stick with, with what exists today. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.